So now we have conditionally convergent. Okay, so that's the opposite of absolutely convergent. If something is absolutely convergent, it is strongly convergent, and it converges with the absolute value bars on it. If something is conditionally convergent, it is only convergent under certain conditions, all right? But when you put the absolute value bars around it, it doesn't work. So here's the classic right here, all right? Negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n. We've got an oscillator. We have an n to the first on the bottom. And then we run this series from, let's say, n equals 1 to infinity. You can't run it from n equals 0 because it wouldn't exist at 0, of course, on the bottom. So if you look at this right here, if you run the alternating series test on this, you would do the limit as n approaches infinity of the part without the oscillator, so take out the oscillator, and that would be the thing we call the b, b sub n, basically. If you run this limit, it equals zero. Okay, in the divergence test, zero is inconclusive. In the alternating series test, if the part that's not alternating gives you a zero, it is conclusively convergent. All right, so this series is convergent, but it's conditionally convergent because when you put the absolute value bars around it, the absolute value of the oscillator is one, and the absolute value of n from one to infinity is just n. So with bars around it, it turns it into one over n, which is a known divergent series. We've been talking about this one the whole chapter, right here. So with bars on it, it diverges, but all by itself, it converges. That is conditionally convergent. So let's go over here. Just really quickly off to the side, let's go over here and write down how you would make your own conditionally convergent series for the test. So you need a sigma. You need to run it to infinity, obviously, because these are infinite series. You need to start at a place where the function actually exists. So you probably don't want to start at zero if you're going to have an n on the bottom. So you probably want to start at 1, you can start at 10, you can start at whatever you feel like, all right? Just make sure it doesn't pass through 0. So not 0, not negative 1, not negative 2. You know, if you start there, you're going to hit the 0. Then you can put an n on the bottom, you can put an oscillator on the top, so you can do negative 1 to the n plus or minus any constant, all right? Could even just be to the n, where c is 0. And then you've got this here, that's pretty much all you need. So the alternating series is going to converge, but then you put the bars on it and it turns into 1 over n, which diverges. So it's only conditionally convergent. All right, now let's go back over here to our ratio test. So the ratio test is all about picking the a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. And that's going to be the next term over the current term. And let's see what that turns out to be. So the next term, n plus 1, would be to change all the n's into n plus 1's. So that'd be negative 2 to the 2 parentheses n plus 1 over 3 to the parentheses n plus 1 plus the extra 1 that's built in. And then change that n into n plus 1, but it also has a minus 1. Okay, divided by the original formula, which is all this, of course. And we hope there's a lot of stuff that cancels. That's kind of the goal here. All right, so let's write it all out. This is just a lot of algebra is all it is. Okay, so we're trying to predict what the ratio from next term to current term, just like Chernobyl back in the integrated three, we're trying to predict if that's gonna fall under one or over one when you get way down the line towards infinity, of course. So let's see what we get. We get negative parentheses two, two n plus two when I distribute. All right, uh, let's see, over, 3 to the n plus 1 plus 1, n plus 2. And then the ones cancel here, you just get n times n. Then we're going to keep change flip. That division becomes multiplication. You get 3 to the n plus 1, n minus 1 in parentheses, and the negative 2 to the 2n flips to the bottom. Okay, now you look for anything you can that will cancel. n minus 1 over n does not cancel. However, base 3, base 3, those will reduce with each other. n plus 2 is higher than n plus 1. So bigger power minus smaller power. n minus n cancels. 2 minus 1 
is 1. You get 3 to the first, but where? Top or bottom? Where it was stronger on the bottom. So you get 3 to the first down here. That takes care of those two. All right? We're kind of stuck with the n's, so let me just put the n minus 1 and the n in there. And then these. The negatives cancel. The negatives become positive. The base 2, base 2. That means these can combine. So same base, subtract the powers. This is the stronger one. 2n plus 2 minus 2n cancels the 2n's, and you end up with a 2. So you get 2 squared. Where? Where it was stronger on the top. 2 squared. Okay? And then that simply turns into 4n minus 1 over 3n. Okay, so that's your ratio from next term to current term. One more thing, though, to actually pull off the ratio test. I'm just realizing we need some more space here as I talk to you. So let's just make some space. All right. So final bit of the puzzle here. Take the limit as n goes to infinity. What is happening to this ratio when you get way out there? But not just the ratio, the absolute value of the ratio. That's in case there are any oscillators in there. Since that negative was not inside the parentheses, and since 2 is not a base 1, it's not really an oscillator. Had it been negative inside the parentheses, that would have been an oscillator. But regardless, the bars help fix all that madness for you. Luckily, since we're going from 2 to infinity, none of this is going to be negative. It's all positive, so you can just drop the bars. So you're going to do the limit as n approaches infinity, but those bars are important in many situations. Don't forget them. Uh, 4n minus 4 over 3n. As you go to infinity, plug in infinity, you get infinity over infinity, indeterminate. Step two, do the weaker, stronger game. Into the first, into the first, it's a tie. Take the coefficients, 4 thirds. That limit is 4 thirds. And the limit is greater than 1. You just proved divergence. So that is divergent. Okay, now, let me look at the sample test and see exactly how I constructed this. Okay, yeah, I've got a box first where you're going to put divergent. That's the first box. The second box says because, all right? You have to tell me why. Why do you think it's divergent? You have to, in the second box, write 4 thirds is less than 1. When I see the 4 thirds, I realize you did the right thing. If I don't see 4 thirds, I start looking through your work trying to give you partial credit because I'm like, all right, well, they tried something, they did something right, but they didn't get four thirds, okay? So that's your evidence right there. I got four thirds, I know it's greater than one, so tell me that it's greater than one. I know, I understand the rule, Mr. Wade, and then it's divergent, beautiful. All right, on that note, number 12, and this one is another ratio test, okay? So we're going to do the same thing again, a sub n plus one over a sub n. We'll eventually put in the absolute value bars, but first let's just set it up. So a sub n plus one, would be 100 to the n plus 1 over 3 times n plus 1 minus 1 quantity factorial divided by a sub n original formula. All right, let's predict what happens to these terms way out there in the millions, billions, trillions, eventually infinity. So that would be 100 to the n plus 1 over distribute 3n plus 3 minus 1 is plus 2. And then that would be times, we'll keep change flip this thing here, and make it look like that. Okay, same base, 100, 100, subtract the powers. Stronger minus weaker, n plus 1 minus n is 1. And it goes to where the stronger one was. It's 100 to the first on top. Okay, so we're just 100, basically. All right, how to deal with factorials. We did this before in class. Pick the bigger one, not the, the smaller one. The bigger one's 3n plus 2, quantity factorial. That is composed of the parentheses, 3n plus 2, times the next integer lower, 3n plus 1, whatever that is, times the next integer lower, 3n, times the next integer lower, 
3n minus 1. And you stop right there because we just matched the top. And you just let it be a factorial, which will carry you all the way down to the rest of the way down to times 3, times 2, times 1. That's where factorials stop, always. Okay, so you replace this with this expression. You cancel these, and you're left with 3n plus 2, 3n plus 1, and 3n on the bottom. Plus 2, 3n plus 1, and 3n. Okay, and now we need to do the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of this statement right here. Okay, so the limit as n approaches infinity, that's the formula for basically the jump to each next term as you go through. Let's see if it's small enough to be convergent or too big and it's divergent. Down here. Okay, so when you do the infinite limit, we're going to put bars around it, although 100 is positive, and all these three ends in here are positive from 1 to infinity, so you could just forget the bars. Weak or stronger, or to actually just plug in infinity. 100 over infinity is 0. Or the weaker, stronger game, the top one's weaker, it's 0. Either way, the limit is less then 1, convergent. So in the first box, you put convergent. Okay? And then in the other box, I asked because. Because of what? 0 is less than 1. You're showing me you got 0, and you're showing me you know that it's less than 1, which makes it convergent. All right? I even think I put on my solutions, you could even be fancy and write absolutely convergent because the ratio test always requires absolute values. And so it actually applies and, and proves not just convergence, but absolute convergence as well. Kind of interesting. OK? All right, that's that one. Number 13. And in number 13, you're simply going to do the divergence test, because it tells you to. So remember the divergence test. You take the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, the formula. And if you plug in infinity, which is your first option for infinities, you get 1 over infinity, which is 0. All right, remember the divergence test. If you get 0, it is inconclusive. So in the box, you're going to put inconclusive. All right, that's not what you want in the divergence test. The divergence test does not test for convergence. It tests for divergence. If you don't get 0, if you get anything else other than 0, then it is divergent for sure, all right? So that's a simple test, but also it can lead to unknown results. Think about 1 over n, you would get 0 here, it's divergent. Think about 1 over n squared, you would get 0 here, that's convergent. See, the 0 tells you nothing, does it? But then, let's see, do we have a second blank there? Yeah, we have a second blank because you have to say because, right? Because what? So in the second blank, I would say the limit as n approaches infinity of... You could write a sub n for short, or you could write the actual 1 over n squared plus 9. And I want you to show me that it equals 0 in the other box. That's your evidence right there. Okay? So use a sub n notation or 1 over n squared plus 9 there. And all right, inconclusive. So now we do the same series with the integral test. And we hope that the integral test can give us more answers. I think it can. We'll integrate from 0 to infinity of 1 over x squared plus 9 with a dx on the side. Okay, This is one of the nine things we can commonly integrate off the top of our heads back there on that board. The integration of 1 over x squared plus 9. You have to recognize the plus that kind of looks like a t as the arctangent. Remember? It's the old arctangent. a squared equals 9. So a equals 3, all right? So the arctangent integration is 1 over a arctangent of x over a with a plus c, except this time there is no plus c because it's definite integration, not indefinite integration. We actually have limits of integration, OK? Um, remember, for review purposes, if there's a square root and a subtract, of course, it would have to be 9 minus x squared the other way around. You get arc sine, 
and there is no one-third coefficient in the arc sine formula. The arc tangent has the one-third. Okay, now, that's an improper integral. It's got an infinity in it. So you have to do the limit as t approaches infinity of one-third arc tangent of x over 3 from 0 to t. All right, then we plug in top minus bottom. Okay, let's put that down here. Hopefully we're still on the screen. Yes, we are. So limit as t approaches infinity of one-third arc tangent of t over 3 minus one-third arc tangent of 0 over 3, which is 0. Okay, you will need to know the arc tangent graph because we've, we've actually gone back to it several times throughout recent chapters. It keeps coming back, so you kind of have to know it. We did it in chapter 9, we're doing it again here. The arc tangent graph is a sideways snake but it's trapped between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 and goes through the origin. So all that's important right there. Okay. When you plug in infinity, you get the arc tangent of infinity over 3, which is the arc tangent of infinity. What's the arc tangent of infinity? Or as you go to infinity, because you can't actually be at infinity, right? So what's the arc tangent as you go towards infinity? The arc tangent of infinity is pi over 2 because the horizontal asymptote. That's what it's going towards, okay? So one-third stays. This part goes to pi over 2 minus one-third times arc tangent of 0, origin 0. So the second term drops out, okay? And you end up with pi over 6. So your final answer from the integration is pi over 6. Now, how do you play that into the boxes? Does that mean convergent, divergent, or inconclusive? If the integral test gives you a positive, finite number, that means convergence. Okay? So now, to finish this off, let me make a little space right here. In the box, the first box, you will put convergent. And then in the second box, it says, because what? Why? Why do you think so? Because the area, pi over 6, is a positive, comma, finite number. And anything along those lines will be fine. Instead of area, you could write out the whole, you know, the original integral, 0 to infinity. But, but why? Area is easier to write. Okay? And so show me that you got pi over 6. Tell me that you know because it's a positive finite number that there's actually convergence. And that's fine. That's all you need. Okay, now let's hit number 15 over here. We have a comparison test. Okay, because all the other tests, they're not so great at assessing these when you stick in like a minus 8 or a plus 2 or something on the bottom or even on the top. So the comparison test is great for this. Okay, comparison test. First, make an educated guess, a logical guess. n over n cubed minus 8 is kind of like n over n cubed, roughly, without the minus 8. n over n cubed would be 1 over n squared. Okay, we know 1 over n is divergent. We know 1 over n squared is convergent by the p-series test. So I'm kind of thinking this is probably going to be convergent because it's acting like 1 over n squared. Okay, so let's, let's guess convergent. Okay, convergent guess. No, you can't just put that in the box because it may end up being inconclusive. It might end up being divergent. Some of these completely surprise you, okay? They even surprise me as a mathematician sometimes. So, we're gonna guess convergent, but that doesn't mean anything yet. So, how do we make sure by the comparison test? I'm going to try to pick something, some function that is greater than, we'll call it b sub n, that is greater than n over n cubed minus 1, that is also, we'll put and convergent. If you can pick a function that's larger than this and it converges, then anything lower than that would also converge, which is kind of obvious if you think about it, all right? So, the first thing we did, we did this in class, we first focus on the numerator, n cubed minus 8, but since we're only focusing on the numerator, we're going to switch this inequality sign here. 
we actually need something over here that is less than or equal to the n cubed minus eight, something lower. All right, could you pick n cubed? No, n cubed is actually more than n cubed minus eight, right? n cubed take away eight, that's gonna be lower. That doesn't work. So you have to go a little bit lower than that. We could do n squared. In, any n squared is weaker than any n cubed, okay? So that's definitely true for sure. If that's true, flip both sides. One over n cubed minus eight would be now flip the inequality and take the reciprocal of this side. It would be less than or equal to one over n squared, okay? One over n squared is larger because remember, the weaker the denominator, the larger the function. The smaller the denominator, the weaker the function, okay? So we got this right here. This is great, but it's not the original question. We're trying to rebuild the, the original series. You notice we're just missing an n on the top. That's all we need. So we're gonna multiply both sides by n and n, all right? And you end up getting n over n cubed minus eight is less than or equal to n over n squared is one over n. All right, what's one over n? That's known to be divergent. Didn't we want something that was convergent that was larger than that? Yeah, we found something that was divergent that was larger than that. Everything's less than a divergent series. Everything's lower than infinity. That didn't prove anything, did it? But wait, there's something that can save you that you may not have noticed. It didn't say you had to do the comparison test. It said you could do a comparison test. Well, we've got the comparison test, and then we have the limit comparison test. Thank you, Augustine Cauchy, for discovering that one. So let's go back over here. If you try all that on the test and it works, great. If it doesn't work and you prove that a probably convergent series is lower than a divergent series, which proves absolutely nothing, go back to your original theory. Your original theory that we talked about was n over n cubed minus eight is like one over n squared. Remember that was one of the first things we said? Okay, if the regular comparison test, which they often call the direct comparison test, if the direct comparison test doesn't work, you can do the limit comparison test. Do the limit as n approaches infinity of the original series divided by the series you think it looks a lot like. And if you remember from class, these can go in either order. It doesn't matter if you put the original on top or the original on the bottom. It matters not, because all you're going to do is a keep change flip, whichever one's on the bottom is going to flip, doesn't really matter here, and so in this case it would be n squared over 1. If you put those two together, we're doing the infinite limit of n cubed over n cubed minus 8. Plug in infinity, you get infinity over infinity. Not enough information, right? Indeterminate forms, right? Indeterminate conversations with Mr. Wade. So you go to the second step, which would be either you could do L'Hopital's, but it's going to take you like three L'Hopital's. That's going to be messy. Or you could just say weak or stronger, cube, cube. It's a tie. So the answer is the leading coefficient divided by the leading coefficient. One over one is one. All right. If, now, in some of our tests, if you get one, that's bad. Ratio test, inconclusive. It's good in the limit comparison test. Remember, if you get any positive finite number, basically any number between zero and infinity is fine, and we just got a number between zero and infinity, which means if this one is convergent, then the given series is also convergent. When you get between zero and infinity, that means they're both convergent or both divergent. They behave the same. Genius of Cauchy, I'm telling you. So do we know one over n squared is convergent? Heck yeah, we do. That's convergent by the p-series test, remember? Convergent by p-series. So if this is a very well-known convergent series right here, then you betcha the given series is also convergent. Okay, now let's officially put it in the boxes. Now I've run out of room over here, so let's go back over there. So in this box, we're going to put convergent, 
And you don't have to tell me that you use the um, limit comparison test as opposed to the comparison test, that's fine. But in the blank right here, so you're gonna say one is a positive finite number and that will tell me that you did the correct comparison and that you actually got a valid response, all right? A valid result. Okay, so that's how to do that one. And then this one's gonna be similar. This one also says a comparison test. Now I'll go ahead and tell you this. There'll be one comparison test on the test 11 that doesn't work, so you have to go to the limit comparison test. Then there'll be another problem where the comparison test does work where you don't have to go to the limit comparison. So I'll go ahead and tell you that, that there's gonna be one of each, all right? Since we just did the one that required a limit, this one should not require a limit. We should just be able to do the normal comparison test and it's gonna work this time. All right, so n squared over n to the 10th is kind of what this is behaving like, right? If you just leave out all the fluff and focus on the strongest ones. So that's like one over n to the eighth, okay. So this is definitely gonna be convergent, right? I mean, one over n to the eighth, it's not even close to one over n squared, which is also convergent, not even remotely close to one over n, which is definitely divergent. So this should be okay. We're gonna guess convergent, but we do have to prove it. And then you pull out your other rules from this chapter and none of the other tests work. And so thank goodness we have a comparison test. All right, if we think this is convergent, let's show that this is actually less than or equal to another known convergent series, which we'll call B sub n, all right? But first, focus on the denominator. Make n to the 10th plus n greater than or equal to some denominator that's gonna be our denominator of B sub n. Think of something that's lower than n to the 10th plus n. Well, let's see, isn't n to the 10th lower than n to the 10th plus n? Because that's plus extra stuff, right? Don't be clever and try to go like into the ninth, into the eighth, into the seventh. I mean, is that a true statement? Yeah, but you can easily get yourself into an inconclusive mess later on. That's the problem. That's why you want to keep it simple, all right? Stay pretty close to this. If that had been minus n, this wouldn't have worked. So you would have dropped down to into the ninth, kind of like earlier what we did, all right? But don't, don't get too clever and go too far from what the series looks like. Okay, true statement. Flip both sides one over this would be less than or equal to, all right, switch around the inequality, one over n to the 10th, okay? That's a true statement. Now I'm trying to rebuild this original term right here, okay? Let me multiply this side by n squared plus nine so I can get that in there. And this is not a case of what you do to the left, you do to the right, not always. I mean, that happens a lot in math, right? Not here. Pick something on the other side that is greater than, because the alligator wants to eat the bigger one. Remember middle school, right? The alligator wants to eat the bigger one. Find something on this side that is larger than n squared plus nine. Could you pick n squared? No, that's smaller than n squared plus nine. Let's go up to n cubed. n cubed is definitely larger than n squared plus nine, okay? Remember, keep it simple. Don't stray too far away or you'll get some of that indeterminate stuff going on. Okay, is this the original sequence or series in this case? Yes. Is it lower than this one? Yes. What is n cubed over n to the 10th? One over n to the seventh. Do you know that's convergent? Of course by the P-series test, the easiest test in this entire chapter. By the P-series test, one over n to the anything higher than first is convergent. So by P-series test, convergent. Okay, now let's look at the boxes and how I laid this out, all right? This is number 16. It says the behavior of this series is blank. Definitely convergent, we just proved that. So in one box, you would put convergent, okay? And then in your second gigantic box, it says what? It says because. What do you put in the because box? Okay, here's the simplest thing. Remember, there are so many ways to write this. Simplest thing you can put in the other box. Instead of writing all this out, this whole series out, just call it a sub n, okay? a sub n, is less than or equal to what? Tell me what you chose. 
I just erased it, but wasn't it one over into the seventh? Show me what you chose to make it less than, and I will look at that and know exactly what you were thinking, don't worry, okay? It's less than this, which is convergent, so you do have to tell me the other one that you picked, the other series is also convergent, which is convergent by P-series test. We literally just said this. We're just putting it in a box now, okay? So show me given series. If you want to write it out, you can, but you could just put A sub N. Less than what did you choose? Why is what you chose convergent? P-series test. Voila. Okay? All right. Number 17. Now these infinite series have tons and tons of real life applications. Of course they do. And who else can better bring you a real life application in a math class than Mr. Wade, right? It's my specialty. So I concocted this series right here that actually shows you how trees grow. In this case, this is the red spruce tree. So N is in decades, and A sub N is in biomass per demand per decade, all right? Don't worry too much about the scientific terms. But in layman's terms, here's what happens scientifically. These trees, they sit there, and they sprout their leaves, and they soak in the sun's rays, and it gives them energy, and then they grow several feet. And then they exhaust their energy, and they get tired, and they sit back and relax, and they sprout more leaves, and they soak in the sun's rays, and then they grow more. It's a real-life alternating series. Grow, rest, grow, rest. Not linear growth at all. So it's an alternating series here. Okay, we're going to find out when is this infinite series within plus or minus 0 0.25, that refers to the N, by the way, always, so that's within decades of where it's going to finally top out. Will a tree live infinite years? Of course not. But it will live hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So when we say infinity, we're talking like, when is it finally going to reach its top height and stop growing? Okay? Way, way down the line. So let's figure out when is it almost done growing, basically, is what we're saying. Okay, remember the secret now. You have to take the absolute value, just in case there's an oscillator that'll fix it for you, and there is an oscillator. And according to this theory we did in class, you pick the next term after the partial sum, and you use that to predict how close you actually are to the end, without even knowing what the infinite sum is. It's amazing, okay? Absolute value, a sub n plus one. Now, that should fall beneath the error, which is 0.25, which of course we're gonna make that one fourth because we don't deal with fractions, or, or decimals, we deal with fractions. All right, we're going to do the absolute value of negative 2, change n into n plus 1. Negative 1, change n into n plus 1. And then 9 minus, change n into n plus 1. Quantity squared, we'll put a bar there. And this has to fall below 1 fourth, but first we have a lot of cleaning up to do, that's for sure. All right, let's see if we can try this here. So, the absolute value of negative 2 is 2. The absolute value of n plus 1, is that positive or negative? From 4 to infinity, n plus 1 is positive. So the absolute value stays the same. Negative 1 to the n plus 1 is your oscillator. It just goes negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1. The absolute value of that is just 1, or drop it. Now, this guy down here, 9 minus n plus 1 quantity squared. If you take 4 and plug it into n, you get 5 squared is 25. 9 minus 25, you're already in negative territory. Plug in a bigger number than 4, like 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, it's getting more and more negative. This thing is a negative. So when you take the absolute value, you switch the signs. The minus becomes a positive n plus 1 quantity squared. And the 9 becomes a minus 9. And there is your new formula that you want to set less than 1 fourth. Okay? We also said in class there was a shortcut if you want to take it, instead of doing these two steps, you could just remove the oscillator and take the rest of this. Of course, you still have to put in n plus 1 in place of n. So you have to have some n plus 1s in there. And it's going to be a, there's going to be a negative here. But then also this is going to be reversed from the bottom so a reverse and a negative, two wrongs make a right, okay? So you could either take this, leave out the oscillator, put in n plus one, or you could do what we just did. It's up to you. 
Now solve the equation using your integrated skills. Okay, we're going to cross multiply. We're going to multiply both sides by 4 to get it out of here and up here. And we're going to multiply both sides by n plus 1 quantity squared minus 9 so that it disappears here and comes up over here next to this 1. We'll just write over top of that 1. Okay, so now we get 8 distributed to n plus 1. So 8n plus 8 is less than, and over here we have n plus 1, which we will FOIL with itself since you can't distribute squares across addition and subtraction. So n plus 1 times n plus 1 would be n squared plus n plus n, which is plus 2n, and then 1 times 1 is 1, minus 9. Now, if you're a great student, even if you're a mediocre student, you can see this is going to be a factor problem. You've got to get everything on one side and get 0 on the other, of course. So let's subtract 8n from both sides and subtract 8 from both sides, and we'll get a 0. Okay, n squared. Subtract 8n over 2n minus 8n is negative 6n. And if you subtract 8 over, well, first of all, 1 minus 9 is negative 8, minus 8 is negative 16. Why did Mr. Wade pick the red spruce instead of any other tree out there? Because I researched like 50 trees for you, and they were all nice alternating series, but none of them were factorable when you got down here. Finally, I got one that was factorable. So here it is. We need two numbers that multiply to be negative 16 and add to be negative 6. All right. So 0 less than n, n, the two numbers would be negative 8 and positive 2. That would multiply to be negative 16. That would add to be negative 6. So we're going to get, now wait, this is not where it's equal to 0. You can't just say, oh, positive 8, negative 2. Those are the answers. Those are the zeros. I'm done. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Positive 8 and negative 2 are the neutrals. That's true. But for inequalities, when you do inequalities back in middle school, or you, you should have, you're supposed to put these on a number line, the neutrals, negative 2 and positive 8. And then you have to drop in sample points, OK? So some sample points. Let's pick some different numbers or different ink here. First of all, 0, uh, negative 100, positive 100. Hey, yeah, we've done this before. All right. If I plug in 0 down here, I get 0 minus 8 is negative 8 times a positive 2. That's a negative. Wait, we want this to be greater than 0, not less than 0. We want it to be greater than 0. That's negative. That's not greater than 0. I bet if we go past 8, it will work. If you plug in 100 minus 8 and 100 plus 2, that's a positive times a positive. That's a positive. And that's what we wanted. We wanted greater than 0. By the way, you don't even have to check below negative 2 because remember, the series starts at 4, so you don't have to go down there at all. The winner apparently is the number 8, or let's say past 8. So if you go past 8, what's the very next thing? S sub 9, the partial sum S sub 9. We'll get you there, OK? Now, let's look at how we're supposed to answer this. Let's, let's put it over here. So it said, how many years does it take to get within plus or minus 0.25 of it stopping its growth, basically? All right, well, the 9 means we're going to go all the way to n equals 9. Was it 9 decades? So the answer is actually 9 decades. So you're doing a real life interpretation, so be smart. Or it does say years. So I would take 9 decades, but I'd rather you say 90 years. So after 90 years, it's actually settled into basically as tall as it's going to get. And in fact, that's true. After 90 years, the red spruce tree is pretty much maxed out. Real life stuff. All right. Let's try the last problem back over there. And you would think the hardest one comes last on the test? No, not at all. Actually, the easiest one probably comes last. You have to find the sum of this series. Now, wait, hold on a second. What did I tell you in this whole entire sample test, in this whole chapter? All these series are way too hard for you to actually find the sum of, unless you have some sort of Excel spreadsheet or you do like a lot of college mathematics. You're not supposed to know how to sum up these things. Matter of fact, the best we can do on the sample test is estimate the infinite sum. We can't even find the infinite sum. Too difficult. 
except for one thing. The thing from integrated three, the thing called a geometric series, that you can find the sum of. Is this in the form a r to the n? It is. The base one third is your ratio. In other words, every year or every month or every term, whatever this is, it multiplies by one third and gets smaller. It multiplies by one third and gets smaller. It multiplies by one third and gets smaller every single time. All right, so that's true. Now, remember the, 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 the theorem, the, the formula. What am I trying to say? Should that be a blooper? No, let's just keep going. All right, the formula is S sub infinity equals first term, initial value basically, over one minus r. It's the only series you can sum up basically in high school because the rest of these are too hard. So the first term, plug in, two is the starting point. Two plus one is three, and one third cubed would be one cubed over three cubed, which is 1 27th, over one minus r, which is one third. Okay, disguise one as three thirds and get 1 27th over 3 thirds minus 1 third is 2 thirds. And then a little keep change flip to finish it off. 1 27th times 3 over 2. Boy, I love the cross cancel right there. 3 over 27 is 1 ninth. And you end up getting 1 times 1 is 1, and 9 times 2 is 18. So if you sum this from 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all the way to infinity, it will never even get past 1 18th because the numbers are so tiny all added up together. But it, it will converge. You can see it's convergent because all geometric series with a base less than 1 will always converge as long as it's less than 1 but greater than negative 1, if you remember that thing we said absolute value of r less than one okay and that is a winner right there my friends and that is sample test 11. cue the bloopers i'm sure there were plenty oh, now only time the ratio test is inclusive i'm oh, sorry inconclusive you stupid dummy we're gonna make series go from series so negative you buffoon positive thing what? okay so it says the infinite sum will never out in the jam when we other when we bring those with you to mind. And now these applications, tons of real life applications, tons of them. But right here, now these real life infinite series, and of course leave it tons and tons of real life applications. Now the comparison. Oh my gosh! The comparison test is really useful. Why am I blurry? Now the comparison test is super, is very, very useful. What is going on is very, very, it is very, very, very useful. I can't believe I am when other tests don't work. I just flubbed it and I wasn't even blurry. I'm never gonna get through this line.